Change your thoughts, and let me press you specifically on One Belt, One Road. From your perspective, what do you think it means for longer-term market access and from a terms of trade and a trade flows point of view? Should we be welcoming this? Now, every country in Southeast Asia welcomes Chinese investment, wants to be part of One Belt, One Road because it's a golden opportunity to become more connected both domestically within the region and beyond the region. But China is big, and China is long in the historical memory of countries in ASEAN. So there's a certain fear that they may become overly dependent on China, that because of these links, China will control you and manipulate you. Because of this, the instincts of Southeast Asian countries is to be promiscuous. Yes, be close to China, but never be exclusively with China. Because of this, the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans will always be welcome. If you ask Southeast Asian countries to choose between A or B, they'll find it intolerable. They will want to be close to China, and they cannot afford to have China as an enemy. But they do not want China to be the exclusive partner. And because of this, I would say in many respects, the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans are free riders in Southeast Asia. And this region will always remain open to them, and they should avoid putting pressure on Southeast Asian countries to choose. They don't like that. And China too must understand this, which I think it does. And let me bring in Greta. Some have even gone as far to say that there is a great game, there is a new great game going on in Asia with China and these other powerhouses vying for influence in this region, be it politically, strategically, or economically, similarly in Africa as well, in the developing world more broadly. And the least developed countries are stuck in the middle. Is that a fair assessment? I hear the discussion about the role of multilateralism. It has been a discussion for decades. Uh, what will small countries benefit from? What will uh, weaker groups benefit from? To me, it comes back again to uh, uh, inclusion. What rules of engagement do we have to secure equal opportunities for all? I'm a Norwegian. I come from a small country. We always benefited from open trade and uh, also were very vocal on the need for a fair framework of uh, engagement. So uh, for us, again in the UN, it is about how to secure also inclusion for uh, those fragile and poor countries who would uh, not immediately benefit from the opportunities we speak about here. Let me just follow up on that because uh, I find Norway fascinating because you have access, you're blessed with oil and you've been very prudent. You've developed a sovereign wealth fund to spread the wealth and to invest in the long term. A lot of these developing countries within uh, ASEAN and Asia for that matter, the broader region, are blessed with resources. Take Myanmar, for example, oil and gas, gemstones. How can countries like Myanmar that are blessed with natural resources avoid the av resources curse and ensure that the resources wealth is spread equitably? So I can only refer to my Norwegian uh, experience and uh, if you go back, you have to go back more than 100 years. Uh, what institutions were needed? Uh, what investments were needed, what legislation was needed, and how uh, to prioritize. So we were already managing water back uh, more than 100 years ago. And uh, the way we did that, making sure that the national resources remained on national hands, but well developed, and how we invested in education, and over decades actually built strong institutions that we were able to govern ourselves, I think were very important to our management of oil and gas. But as some have said, the oil and gas was found in Norway in a decade 
that actually made it possible for Norway to make its choices, they are maybe not available this decade. So I would be very careful in advising other nations how they should go about it. But strong institutions, strong investments in education, making sure it was equally distributed was very solid parts of our solutions. Sri, I think, I think that's the point. I mean, natural resources become a curse when you don't take advantage of the blessing to diversify your economy. And, and I think the countries that have done that or are trying to do that, Nor Norway has done it, and, and banked a lot of the benefits from natural resources to invest for future generations. Human capital has always been a focus in the country. Have, you know, have been able to avoid the curse. Uh, other countries have exploited the wealth for immediate use and corruption. Uh, and not taking advantage of the opportunity to diversify. Look at what's going on in Saudi Arabia now with Vision 2030. That's all about economic diversification and moving away from the basic energy industries. And it's such an important strategy to the success of that kingdom. It could be done in any country, including Myanmar, that has the advantage of na some natural resources. John, thank you for that. And let's move on to the issue of uh, new technology. And I wanted to bring in big data, which has been described as the new oil. And how can businesses, policymakers, and civil society for that matter, harness what is increasingly being seen as a 21st century resource? And what does it mean for ASEAN? Let's bring in our resident um, tech expert first. Uh, Jamal, <laughs> your thoughts? I wouldn't say I'm a tech expert for sure. Uh, big data, I mean, I guess we, we are using that word quite generically, quite in a, in, a, in a broad sense of the word on digital analytics and, you know, uh, information. Definitely, it's an area that all governments must not take a passive view. They must take an active view on how to accelerate the growth and uh, the development of big data. Uh, there are two sides of the coin here. One is the, to accelerate that, uh, the industry or sub-industries that promote uh, data, like telecommunications company, uh, even uh, finance, banking, and so on. Um, and also the skills required. I do not think that we, in, a, in ASEAN as a, as a region, we have enough skills, for that matter, many countries in the world, to have enough skills to harness the development of uh, big data analytics. Or we, we know, Many of the companies themselves, we are losing dozens and dozens. We brought in people, they left. We brought people, they left. This is a serious issue. Then there are other uh, policy issues with regard to cybersecurity, policy issues with regard to uh, data privacy. Uh, that has to be all in harmonized together with the, the positive development of big data. So can, I, can I just ask you, the regulatory framework simply is not keeping up. And you can say, you can say this, you can apply, apply it to, to a global context. Mm -hmm. It's simply not keeping up with the exponential advances that this technology is making at an astounding rate, yes? For sure, it's yes, not keeping up with it. And some, are, in fact, some require less regulation for, you know, in, in, in areas like uh, financial, uh, fintech areas should be less uh, regulation, uh, be able to, um, harness the, 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 the benefits of data across the region, there should be less uh, regulation. But regulation with regards to data privacy, I think is something is important. Re regulation with regards to cybersecurity is coming really acute. That has to be uh, stepped up. Okay. The role of uh, technology as an enabler, George, you were uh, talking about this earlier, and I think other members of the panel uh, were. Talk to me about how it works in terms of least developed countries, for example, like Myanmar and Cambodia, using technology to leapfrog their economy into the next phase. Are we necessarily talking about completely bypassing the manufacturing stage of this transition, or is that a necessary stage? The, the social media is remarkably well developed in Southeast Asia, partly because of the young population, and growing rapidly. Governments which make use of the social media to improve governance will be able to maintain sustainable growth because then you're forced to respond to problems. 
you take say Prime Minister Hun Sen. He has an enormous following among young people in Cambodia. In fact, some say that he's governing through Facebook. I checked yesterday, he had slightly fewer than 7.7 .7 million followers. When I checked this morning, he's crossed 7.7 .7 million followers. And he's required every minister in Cambodia to monitor comments on Facebook and to respond to them. Now, to me, this is quite astonishing because governing by Facebook? But why not? It allows you to penetrate through layers of bureaucracy. And problems which fester on the ground cannot fester too long because they get surfaced directly to him. And the ministers do not want the prime minister saying, look, uh, have you read these comments? The key is, how do you use this for better governance? And how do you make mobile data cheaper and cheaper in Southeast Asia? I dream of the day when roaming charges are removed in ASEAN. In, Euro in Europe, in China, they're removing roaming charges. And it can be done. But it requires a certain political will. And this is one area where uh, I hope, Jamal, you can persuade uh, <laughs> your, your, your friends in government to give yeah. this a big push. Mm. And I think it will make a big difference to us. Yeah. If I may comment on that? Yeah, please do. I mean, uh, I will talk about roaming, then I'll talk about broadband, which is something I'm passionate about. I, I agree with you. Eventually, this roaming is artificial. It's very artificial where one country to another, after all connectivity in the air, it doesn't matter which country belongs to which country. The, the problem, perhaps, is that there's a huge beneficiary and also losers in this game. So we've got to find a mechanism to equate that. So if you're a country like a um, nation Singapore, you are the beneficiary of roaming. Uh, because, you know, the, the people coming in, the inbound roaming, you, huge charges, you make a lot of money out of that. Uh, some countries, like uh, Cambodia, is the other, the other side of the coin. So they need a mechanism, even within ourselves, to be very frank, within our group, we're trying to find a formula, and it's been extremely difficult within all the com companies that we have. So if that we, uh, we are working towards that, actually. So your point is, it is coming, and it's inevitable, but there must be is some... coming from Asiata? Well, one of the, we are, could, could be one of the architects of, to make this happen. We're going to a catalyst to make this happen. But we need an internal sort of uh, balance of accounts, so to speak, to subsidize certain country versus other countries that we, we operate in, to make it such that everybody gain rather than there's losers and winners. Greta. Uh, actually, new technology can help us connect people in such a big and different way. Uh, UNOPS has the experience to connect uh, uh, mainstream technology with, for instance, uh, entrepreneurs who would develop jobs in their local uh, environment. So think of uh, health. Uh, you can develop apps that can monitor, for instance, certain diseases, and you can also if needed, use drone technology to bring medicine to people who have chronic diseases. A lot of opportunities for education as well. We connect Harvard University and MIT to those innovation hubs that can be placed all over the world so people have access to education that would be, of course, far too expensive to achieve if they had to go to those universities, but now can benefit from the virtual opportunity to access education. So those opportunities from uh, technology is really important. And we spoke about China. We also are engaged in UNOPS in projects in the agricultural sector, actually allowing farmers to market their goods using new technology. So they have shorter access to markets compared to what they had earlier. And the cost curve, the beautiful thing about all this is that the cost curve is coming down. Exactly. And the costs to begin with of sensor technology and drone technology, for example, are minimal, I would imagine. So there's no shortage of public-private partnerships who would want to fund this. Exactly. That's uh, also uh, interesting to see because it offers opportunities not only to build jobs and uh, growth, but also to uh, get the return from investments, um, of course, that uh, is needed to, to uh, make this sustainable. Okay. We've heard a lot about uh, the fourth industrial revolution. 
here at uh, ASEAN and the World Economic Forum. I just want to go around the panel and just ask each of you what it means for you and where we are on that road. And let's start with George, please, if you can. We have the advantage in ASEAN of a young population. Once they're educated, they'll take to the new technology, like fish to water. And we mustn't miss this opportunity. We mustn't wait for them to accumulate years. There's no time to lose. And this must be an area of the highest priority. I would not worry too much about uh, the very high-tech stuff, big data analysis. You, in those areas, we must expect uneven development and the big players may well be outside the region. But governments should make use of the technology to help govern better. And people should use the technology to help them disintermediate, rapacious middlemen in the system. In this way, farmers, small traders can get better access to markets, can buy cheaper and sell dearer. John. I'll take a human capital angle. I think, you know, I started with GE in 1978, and and people actually thought in the 70s and 80s that you could get a job, do it for a long time, plan to retire from the company that you started with and live happily ever after, and not much would change. And if you look at the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution, uh, it, to me it says that every, every job is gonna change. The, the nature, what George just described will change hundreds of thousands of jobs, if, if it really happens, and it likely will. Uh, everybody has to prepare for the 21st century knowing that what they do today to be successful is not necessarily what they're gonna do tomorrow to be successful. So how do we, how do we teach people to, and train them to be adaptable and flexible? Whether you're an accounts payable, a distributor, a doctor, and it doesn't matter what you do or who you do it for, your job is gonna change. And so for me, success in the context of the fourth industrial revolution means that you have to have a workforce, people, human capital, that is adaptable and flexible, lifelong learning and ready to change as the nature of work and jobs change. Well, let's start with the, uh, the go back to the third revolution, which is the IT revolution. Um, and the fourth revolution is to go beyond digital revolution into artificial intelligence, into robotics, uh, into virtual reality, augmented, augmented reality, and so on and so forth. If, if, if where we are right now, we're still in a third, struggling in the third revolution, to be very candid about it. We are not quite there in beyond uh, the uh, digital revolution. We are still in uh, the uh, building the infrastructure required. We are still in the basics of a couple of internet um, businesses of ideas or entrepreneurship that we are building. So we are, we are not quite there yet, to be frank, uh, if I can be candid about it. Th that's why, you know, again, coming back to my, uh, you know, why I'm here and, why, and we are big advocacy of broadband being a national agenda, not a telecom agenda, not this little industry called IT, but the whole national agenda because it, it touches every human being. It's the basis of which fourth uh, revolution can ever succeed. You need that baseline upon which new economics, new digital economics, and therefore beyond digital revolution can happen. So we're not quite, we're quite, not quite there yet. So, you know, I, I hope we have uh, 700 uh, business leaders here, <coughs> opinion leaders, political leaders here, to put that in national agenda where it requires thinking, rethinking about regulatory, rethinking about uh, things like spectrum, uh, the industry structure, uh, incentive, funding, you know, and capital, human capital, bill. There's a lot of things need to be done. We are still there. And however, uh, as mentioned by George, we are in a sweet spot here. We have a young population uh, of, you know, 40% uh, uh, millennials. We have uh, uh, 630 million population. We have uh, the, in a way, the, the demographic behavior of the people in Asia is generally more uh, adaptable to new technologies. So we have a sweet spot here. Now we have a sweet spot here. We have a great opportunity in the future, but we are still in the, shall I say, in the third revolution. And we can leapfrog. I think that's the point. We can leapfrog if we get this national agenda of broadband, uh, get it corrected and 
accelerate. We need to accelerate. That's, that's why we, it cannot be just a, a telecom agenda. It's got to be national agenda, as important as any economic activities. It's the basis of the future, the way I look at it. And I'm very passionate about it. Greta, if I could just frame the question in a different way, and I do want to ask you about what the fourth industrial revolution means to you, but there's been quite a lot of talk here about uh, the skill shortage amongst young people and whether human capital is leaving or staying. What can we do from the policymaker's perspective, from the business perspective, to help ensure the best and the brightest minds stay where they are? I think, uh, again, uh, coming back to investment in the human capital and social inclusion, where is it attractive for young people, bright people to stay? It is where it is safe to stay, where it is uh, viewed as uh, uh, a good place to live. So uh, if you look at how technology has developed, you find in areas where both taxes are high and where the costs may be high, still a lot of growth and development and why. I think that question is really important to ask. Why has some of the biggest uh, tech companies invested in the part of the world where I come from? Uh, Northern Europe, maybe it is because highly educated people uh, built families and jobs and opportunities that actually also benefit investors long term. But I would like to also bring another dimension into uh, your question because technology allows us to build more resilient societies, more resilient infrastructure. In this part of the world, we have floods, earthquake, and other disasters. And access to information allow us to actually design smarter cities, allow us to build more resilient buildings, allow us to build more resilient agriculture, all these things that matters to people. Why invest in something that will actually sort of flow away with the next uh, flood, go away with the next earthquake. Are we ready to invest more upfront? I think technology introduces a completely different discussion about how we do these things right in the first place. We've reached uh, the end of our panel, and uh, if I can just uh, ask each panelist just to give us some final words of wisdom and uh, a summation, just to bookend our discussion. I think that that will be uh, very valuable. And let's start right at the end with George, first of all. We have a great advantage in ASEAN in our outward orientation. You take this meeting here in Phnom Penh, everyone feels comfortable here. You can be from Japan, China, you can be from Europe, from, from America, from India. It's uh, open platform. You will not feel this way in Beijing or in Delhi or in Tokyo or in New York, but you feel it here. And not just in Cambodia, but throughout Southeast Asia. So it's in the soil, it's in the culture. And as Asia develops, this will become the Caribbean for all of Eurasia because long coastlines, beautiful beaches, salubrious weather, good food, service orientation. So if we get governance right and we educate our people and make sure there's law and order and good health, the conditions are extremely favorable in Southeast Asia. This is a golden opportunity not to be missed. There are challenges, but we have to respond to these challenges. And I think there's a fair chance that most of us will be able to. You know, Shri, I, I think it's uh, sustainable economic growth, as we've talked about, is, is, is a, has a lot of factors. Um, you know, at the end, it's about creating jobs. If you want to keep people in the region, you got to have jobs. And they have to be the right kind of jobs. They can't be the jobs that will be disintermediated. You know, if you're a distributor today and you're, you're collecting 3% commission and not creating any value, then technology will disintermediate you at some point. It may be 2017, it may be 2027, it may be 2037. But those distributors in tomorrow's world 
will, will, there'll be no value from them and they will go away. So the, 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 the key for me, the underpinning of sustainable economic growth is job creation and the creation of uh, uh, the development of human capital and, and the creation of workforces that can change and adapt and grow with the requirements that will come in the 21st century. If you don't do that, then there's no way you can have sustainable economic growth. I mean, look at Myanmar. Myanmar, we were one of the first U.S. companies to go into Myanmar after the, the sanctions were, were, were removed. I went there the first time six years ago. Uh, my smartphone didn't work. My iPad didn't work. My, I had terrible connectivity. My most recent trip in January, everything worked, okay? But there's still 35 million people in the country that don't have electricity, right? So there, that's not, there's nothing inclusive about that, but it shows you how much progress can be made in a relatively short period of time and also how much more work is left to do. But if we don't create jobs in Myanmar, it's going to be impossible for that development to take place. For me, I guess being repetitive, but it's a very important point, this, the three points. One is the one trillion GDP, incremental GDP opportunity by 2026 for ASEAN. There's a work done actually with Commission 80 continue to do for us, and that's opportunity for broadband. Second, broadband should be a national agenda. It cannot be just passively or naturally or gradually uh, being led by the uh, the, the players, it got to be uh, more offensive by the government and the uh, public sector and private sector got to work together uh, to, and the whole ecosystem, it got to be a, a, a policy to make that happen. It creates jobs, it's important for human capital and so on and so forth. That's the second point. Uh, and it covers every society, it's not just about the, the people who are the rich and the, uh, so on. It covers, it helps the financial inclusion, it rich every aspect of society. Uh, including helps hopefully the uh, seamless roaming uh, that uh, everyone is uh, thinking about in the future. And third is that this is uh, kind of related to the second one, an opportunity for us to leapfrog. We are in the third revolution, we can leapfrog. Uh, the developed countries within the next few years, we get the second right. That's my three key points. Yeah, ASEAN offers such uh, great opportunities uh, uh, and uh, I still think we need to find ways of working better together. Urbanization is uh, real in this part uh, of the world at a level that we've not seen before also taking into consideration the years to come. And uh, the world will benefit if we do uh, find the right solutions uh, the first time. I mean find the green energy solutions, how do we fight and actually uh, build inclusiveness into slum areas and introduce social housing, how do we uh, cl provide clean water, all these things that matters to people. So uh, to the UN and uh, to UNOPS, it's uh, all about how we can help support building national capacity to uh, find ways of working together, also financially, to provide uh, scale to the so solutions that we know we need to find. Greta, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, that brings us to uh, the end of our CNBC debate here at ASEAN at the World Economic Forum. I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists, starting with Greta Faremo. UN Undersecretary General for the United Nations Office for Project Services, Jamaluddin Ibrahim, Managing Director, President and CEO of Axiata, John Rice, Vice Chairman of GE, and George Yeo, former Singapore Trade and Foreign Minister and Chairman at uh, Kerry Logistics. And thank you, the audience, uh, for watching, and uh, we will see you again very soon here at ASEAN. <laughs>